Welcome to London Kurdish Film Festival Global Edition. We are hosting the 12th edition. It is our 20th anniversary since 2001. We've been uh, doing LKF uh, festivals, and today I'm joined by director, producer, writer, very talented man, <laughs> Kurdish man. Let's not say uh, he's he's with me today because we are. Um, Uh, broadcasting two of, uh, two of his films, and uh, both of them are documentaries. And uh, he's, uh, we're going to know a, a bit more about him and his work. So hopefully, at the end of the session, um, if you haven't watched the uh, films yet, I recommend that you do because we have a reward uh, for the classic films, uh, the films in classic uh, collection. And the first uh, three um, audience choice um, films will win uh, three rewards. So uh, I appreciate if you really sign and also choose your best favorite three. So hello, Kay. Thank you hello. for participating. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you. So uh, as I told you, this is the first time uh, that we are uh, hosting a global edition. And also, we are doing a um, classic uh, Kurdish film collection. So this is the first attempt, first time that a, a Kurdish film festival is doing this. So uh, you've been um, selected in in that classic film collection. How do you feel about that? Well, I think I am excited twice. One, because your festival is going global. That's wonderful news. Uh, therefore, now I can say hello to Kurds and Kurdish friends all over the world. And uh, hey, please watch the films and vote for mine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm really excited because my films are often selected in film festivals and have been around for many, many years. But, you know, it's never like taking part in a Kurdish film festival. It just sort of has the flavor of home. And and uh, that makes me really happy. I'm very excited. Thank you very much for selecting my films. Uh, th thank you. So um, both films, as I said, are documentaries. So uh, one of them is Return to Kirkuk, A Year in the Fire. And the other one is uh, um, No Friend But the Mountains. From the names, you can see that they've been named specifically. I'm sure Kay is going to tell us why He actually has chosen these names for, for his um, festival uh, films. And also, um, I can say that he is the main actor. He's actually, actually he's acting as well. So he's been uh, filming, he's been acting like a, uh, I would say, journalist. So you can see him uh, narrating the film, telling the story. But actually, he says the story from his own story. So he's making it very uh, clear for the audience it, it's like it feels like he's telling a story to children so i like that um, uh, a lot because you know we have lots of um, complicated issues mostly it is difficult to uh, explain that to the global audience so i i actually congratulate you that making really uh, simple and clear for the global audience so Did you choose specifically, you know, to act in the film, you know, like a journalist? Because uh, I'm sure it wasn't it, it wasn't easy, you know, to act, to narrate, and also to film, isn't it? Uh, did, did you choose this style specifically, or is it something you end up doing it? Right. Uh, well, it's very interesting. I need to go back a little bit to the beginning. Uh, I don't. I am by actual passion a fiction storyteller. Whereas when I first made it to Europe in 1980, and I presented myself as someone coming from Kurdistan, I saw a very strange reaction from the Europeans. They looked at me like I was an alien because they didn't know oh. what, what was Kurdistan. Where was Kurdistan? And I believe, for, I believe because of the so many years of the armed struggle, the Peshmergas and the guerrillas and the fighting for the freedom of Kurdistan, 
I kind of thought we were like the South America, like Jaguara. We would be really known all over the world. So I was shocked and surprised when people said, is it Pakistan? Or they just didn't have a clue about Kurdistan. Uh, and therefore, so are, I, are you are you talking about the UK? People well, no. I, at the time, Europe I was general. at the Europe in general. But at the time, I was in in Italy. I used to live in Italy in 1980. I made it out of. I am from South Kurdistan, uh, what is internationally known Kurdistan region of Iraq. Or uh, yeah, I don't like to call it with names of Iraq or Syria or Turkey. Or I, I like much more to say South or North or West or East. That's, so yeah, that's what I, I made it to Europe in 1980 and I had this reaction and before because of that I decided to go on a mission to take the voice of the Kurds to the world and I can say I was one of the very first Kurds to start making documentaries and broadcast my films on the BBC, uh, Channel 4, Al Jazeera English, many countries around the world. So the mission was Okay, if I can't take the world to Kurdistan, I'm going to take Kurdistan to the world. And this is how documentaries started. And with regards to the style, you are absolutely right. I am uh, my first uh, love for the entertainment world started as an actor. So I did drama school in Italy and I worked as an actor in Italy with Italian theater company in Italian. And when I started to do documentaries, I didn't really want to make it just observational because I am a Kurd. I'm not going to be biased in my documentaries. I want to tell the truth, the reality on the ground as it is. But I wanted to be on the ground. I wanted to be part of it. And also that way I had two objectives. One, I made the people feel much more comfortable in my approach so that we are interacting together and the the other one is very important like because my films is for the global audience and most of the time the films are in english maybe subtitled uh, when people are speaking in kurdish or other languages but the global audience like personal stories they want to see to follow you so in all my documentary films, um, I think I have about 20 short and feature length documentaries. They are always, always told through a personal view, a personal approach. And this is why you see me in front of the camera and um, integrate, um, interacting with the people on the ground. And I think this is really important for us Kurt because our situation is far too complex. Uh, even just by trying to explain to someone, it will take you ages. So yes. it, yet to attract them, especially with this very competitive world of the media, you have hundreds, thousands of films, very well-made films, international films, and you want to attract your audience. So you really want to take them in to engage them, to grab them. And by that, yeah. for example, in Return to Kirkuk, A Year in the Fire, when I go back to visit the prison I was held in by Saddam's secret police at the age of 14, you as an audience think, wow, this guy has been there. OK, uh, Kay, don't, for don't forget what you're saying, because it is very important. Say, for instance, even now, I don't think you would have an opportunity actually to go into those prison and film. So I think it's very important. So can you tell us a bit more? How, how was it, you know, filming there at the time? Uh, uh, when I watch your films, I feel like you empty, you know, uh, shoot the film, but you find yourself in, in different situation, you see. So you don't know what's going to happen even while you're filming. So how did you come about, you know, visiting yeah, and then you, you get the permission you know, to go places that actually um, you don't have permission to go. Uh, absolutely. Um, I know just the main story of my film. 
So for example, in return to Kirkuk Air in the fire, it's about a Kurd who has been exiled for 25 years, yeah. myself, and now is going back to South Kurdistan, Iraq, to vote in the first democratic election. Yeah. That's all I know. And I say, this is what I said to the BBC at the time, because I made a proposal and sent it to BBC and other broadcasters saying, that is not what the people on the ground want to vote for, especially the Kurds. They would not vote for a democratic Iraq. They don't even believe in a democratic Iraq if you give them a chance. And the BBC answered me saying, uh, how would you prove that? I said, well, I'm going to take my own personal ballot box parallel to the Iraqi election. Yeah. I will yeah. do my I think, own, right? And then really, I will at the end, really interesting. Yeah. At, at the end, we will find out if the people would want to vote for an independent Kurdistan to separate from Iraq or they would want to vote for a federal Iraq with Kurdistan to be part of it. So that's how much I knew. Okay. But I knew that the situation was very dangerous. I knew there were insurgents and killings and explosives everywhere, every day. So what, what year was that, Kay? What year was that? 2005. Okay. Yes, because the Shiites were killing the Sunnis, the Sunnis were killing the Shiites. They were both together trying to kill the Kurds. There were lots of terrorism going on and um, they were trying to boycott this election. The Americans on the ground, it was, I mean, when you watch the film, you will realize, wow, that's why it's called A Year in the Fire. Because I took, I went there three times during the whole year to cover the whole process. Okay. okay. And so while I'm on the ground, we had to be very careful because, especially in that year, there were no foreigners on yeah. the ground, no journalists, no filmmakers, because no broadcasters, no institutions would allow their own people to go to Iraq or Kirkuk. Their life. It was far too dangerous. Far okay. too dangerous. And therefore, when I went there and came back and the BBC broadcast uh, 15 minutes, BBC Two during Newsnight uh, with, with Jeremy Paxman um, after um, I returned for the first round. But then I went again for the second election when they voted for the federalism and then went again the third time. And it was becoming more and more dangerous. So how would I find my way around? Well, Number one, fortunately, I um, originated from Kirkuk. Number two, yeah. I had number two, I had family members there. And number three, we the, the filmmaker behind the camera, uh, whom I worked now for twenty years together, Claudio von Planta, originally Swiss guy, who is a big supportive of the Kurds and the Kurdish call for freedom. He was absolutely excellent with another guy called David Niblock because I had to go three times. I had two different filmmakers with me. These yeah. guys were international filmmakers. They've been to Dangerous Zone before. So okay. we, were, we were basically acting on a daily plan. Okay? okay. Today, we know where we are going, but only us two, not even our driver, knew exactly oh. where we would go. We never told anyone our moves. So how would I get my permission? Well, because I speak Kurdish, and in 2005, even so, there were Arabs, Turkmens, Christians, Kurds, mixed ethnicity in Kirkuk. But to be honest, the Kurds were in command already. Yeah. And they were excited that there was a Kurdish reporter, filmmaker. filmmaker, whatever you want to call journalist from the UK who wants to capture the reality on the ground. And therefore yeah. they, were, they were facilitating for me. If, often when I was arrested, after five, 10 minutes, an hour, they would, a, a call would come and they would let me go. Be, because I, I was moving without permission. Uh, I was just going everywhere. <laughs> I really wanted to, you know, 
put this into the perspective. For how long we had Kurdish struggle for our freedom? And how much of that has been documented? I am sad to say, I feel really sad to say, unfortunately, most of it, unfortunately, most of it has gone lost. They were not filmed, they were not documented, uh, and, and especially in the past. And therefore, I wanted not only to capture enough to make a film of 90 minutes out of that experience. Every yeah. time I went back to Kurdistan, even for a short film of 10 minutes, I filmed hours and hours and hours and hours because I wanted to document. Yeah, I see. Okay, uh, so th this is a way of, you know, telling your story too, you know, to attract uh, maybe a uh, global audience, as you said, which is very important. This is the reason why, I mean, we are in London and hosting uh, this global session with our 10 partners. So now uh, all Kurds are scattered, you know, everywhere. So everybody's trying to do their best, you know, to do festival, because this is a way that we can actually introduce films and then make sure that people uh, are able to watch our, our stories and get familiar with Kurds and their, you know, cause what's happening there, and also the fact that we are, you know, multilingual people. So that help us, you know, to tell our stories in, in their languages. So I congratulate you on that. Uh, we have only uh, like seven minutes left now. I want to use that wisely. So I want to know how, if you define, you know, Kurdish cinema. As this year we are doing, you know. Um, a collection of uh, classic uh, Kurdish films. How do you differentiate, like, say, for instance, Kurdish films from European films, maybe French films, maybe USA? Is, is there any specific things that you can say about Kurdish uh, film and cinema? Uh, yes, I think it's really brave because usually to make films and to have uh, so called cinema like French cinema or Italian cinema or British cinema, you need to have a market. In order to have a market, you need to have a sovereign state. You need to have a country. We Kurds don't have a country. We are occupied by Turkey, Iran, Syria, and Iraq. And therefore, we don't have a local market. I can't help but in my films, even if it's entertaining, even if it has humor, but there will be some messages, some morale about the suffering of our people, the injustices, the dictatorships who are not recognizing the minimum, the basic rights of the Kurds. Well, if I am making a film about that, it will not be screened in Iraq, Iran, Turkey, or Syria. So I have no market at all. Therefore, and, and the Kurds are not giving up. They are brave, they are passionate, they have such a love for filmmaking. They are taking advantage of the international film festivals. So they make films locally, sending it out to the international film festivals. However, it will be good. It will be amazing to see also Kurdish films breaking beyond the film festivals and reach the actual market traditionally theatrical release. And now because of the plat many platforms uh, for the streamers like Netflix, uh, Amazon, Disney and the others. So that's where I am. Apart from doc making documentary films, I have actually, uh, I obtained a BA in film and media and a master in feature filmmaking for fiction because I have many stories that cannot be told in documentaries and I want to make fiction films, feature films, and I so, aim yeah. also to the mainstream. <laughs> yeah, I was actually going to ask you if you have any new projects coming up and if they are fiction or documentary, you have answered that. So I want to know, as this is our second online edition, how do you feel about you know, having an online you know, virtual uh, festivals uh, there are benefits. Uh, what do you feel about that? 
uh, <laughs> like you said, there are benefits because probably you can reach a wider audience. But you know, watching a film, it is a unique experience when you sit in the cinema. Somehow you kind of feel the vibe of everyone together, being part of that story, watching that film together. So I will never exchange the experience of watching a film in cinema with an online experience. I would hope we would go to the traditional way, even so with online, you probably reach any more. Are you okay? Yeah, I am sorry about that. So anyway, but still, you know, uh, we are lucky that these platforms exist that even during the COVID-19, you know, we are able to uh, host a festival and we are able to, you know, deliver two different programs. So I do like to thank you, you know, for your contribution, for being with us and explaining your story about your filming and then who you want to reach actually through your films. So um, I'm gonna again uh, uh, announce, uh, you know, to the audience, say that please watch all the films and vote uh, for your best three uh, films in classic, the classic collection. So uh, thank you very much. Then Bash K. So thank hopefully, Sir Keftin, I would say. <laughs> thank yes. you. Thank you very much on all the very best to you, your team, and to your partners. This is a wonderful, absolutely brilliant event you are organizing at Bougie Kurdistan. Thank you.